my god. The dreaded Shikan the Forever Man for both the Genesis and the Game Gear, circa 92, by the combined efforts of Sega and Extended Play Productions, based on Robert E. Cross's comic of the same name. For this diatribe, we're looking at both versions back to back. As usual, before we begin, I'd like to extend my dearest acknowledgments to Matt Lister and his wife Becky Brooks from Dover, New Hampshire, Ian Bergerson and Katie Kreisel from Nashville, New Hampshire, Andrew Efford, Lowry, and Amanda Brack, the former from DIY, obviously, Brain Scratch Commentaries, Brian Bielowski and Walter G. Meyer, Jim Fontenot, aka Kid Shore Yukon, the Bummer City Historical Society, The Dead Collective, Mike Maverick, Charhart Composer of Jubinski, Pryor, and Uzzle, that's Fifth Diamond Machine in Nashville Logic, the Nerdfit Network, including Glen Tye, Sam Mulligan, Star Lab Studios, JMC Facepalm Doherty, Mike Tessa from Zonum, Neon Bomb in Manchester, New Hampshire, Crunkwitch, the Extra Life Boston Guild, the Boston Open Screen Committee, Sidestep Complex, aka The Shields, Bit Bar Salem, Will Spreadbury, aka Force of Will from Lynn, Alley, aka Twill Distilled from Columbus, Ohio, Samus and Mega Ran, Ghost Ship Harbor, Magfest, Pax East, and finally Robert A. Cross himself, including his own company, RAK Graphics. With those out of the way, here goes nothing. Storyline-wise, if you've read some, if not all, of Cross's comics, the premise should at least be second nature, otherwise, for those that haven't, consider yourselves in pure fucking luck. It revolves around the titular sword-wielding Undertaker slash Kruger bastard child hybrid of a mercenary slash alchemist, and his millennium-long eternal curse of hunting all evil apparitions. Of course, he claims to be so exceptional in his swordsmanship and sorcery that even Death himself can't compare with his prowess. Upon making a pact with the latter, aka Old Grim himself, involving the following terms, if Shikan defeats him, eternal life will be entrusted to the confident yet cocky combatant at a price, whereas if death triumphs, his soul will be turned over, and accepting said pact with a harebrained poise, the two finally duke it out, mano y mano, or mano y espectro, oh by the way, for all the Spanish junkies out there, espectro means ghost, as the ground shook endlessly around them, and who could have guessed, the former cursed fates finally come true, hence Shikan stuck with seeking out and exterminating the eight evil supernatural masters on both the terrestrial and elemental planes, the former of which the Spider Queen, Mantis, El Rod and the Dragonfly King inhabit, whereas the latter includes Parasitus, the Tundra Beast, the Fire Dragon, and the leader of the Dragonfly Clan, aka the Synard Rider, after which he'll rest in eternal solitude. Oh, and before I forget, the same applies in the Game Gear version too. Shifting our focus to the gameplay framework, upon commencement, we're introduced to an interdimensional warp hub through which Shikan can access any of the four terrestrial planes in whatever order he desires. Mega Man, anyone? and later the elemental planes, Earth, Air, Fire, and Water. In order to access the latter set of worlds, you have to first storm your way through the former announced terrestrial planes, all of which consist of three areas. Entering one of said planes for the first time leads to an hourglass animation in the background, accompanied by a narration from the Forever Man himself about his innermost aim to pursue and put an immediate end to the chaos his rivals have caused. By now, it should be obvious regarding the game setup. Being a hell of a lot more than just your typical action platformer, the D-pad, as many might expect, migrates the Forever Man anywhere to his heart's content, and even position his swords and other weapons in his eight desired directions while being held out. Stud brings up his alchemy diagram and weapon inventory menu, whereas A, B, and C, depending on which configuration type you've got set beforehand, because the Genesis, goddammit, allow him to attack and or hold out his weapons, jump, and even perform both a ground roll in tandem with the D-pad, specifically down left or down right diagonally, as well as a super flip against her Avengers Shinobi and Shinobi 3, in conjunction with performing an aerial 360 degree slash by attacking, or swap out your weapons on the fly after acquiring them. In the Game Gear version's case, buttons 1 and 2 allow them to attack and jump individually. Aside from pursuing each target offender, which, as if it's not obvious already, is near fucking suicide. There's four additional vital weapons to acquire, and tandem with four different types of chemical flasks, the latter of which are scattered randomly throughout each domain, granting you different magical incantations, hence the previously established alchemy diagram, on which will be further articulated eventually. Those include the axe, the scythe, the grappling hook, and the battering hammer, found in the terrestrial domains of the Spider Queen, Alkenrod, Mantis, and the Dragonfly King respectively, and are great for not only dealing more damage to certain bosses, aside from the trademark twin swords, but gaining more access to further areas within said domains, likewise with the enchanted elemental swords and its Game Gear counterpart, landing ice and fire, discovered in the fourth, 5th and 6th dimensions, fire, ice, and lava, that is, singularly. It's just a matter of how instinctive you are when it comes to utilizing them. Hence his namesake, and in true Echo the Dolphin in Halo fashion, no matter how many times Shikan gets his immortal supernatural ass annihilated, which for the record, will occur on more occasions than one might expect, he'll always end up back at the central warp hub, likewise if his hourglass runs out, with the exception of an interval I'll get to later. <laughs> 
Bouncing back into the multicolored chemical flask and supporting alchemy diagram, to whose purposes I strongly advise referring back, the Elashikon the use of his extraordinary dark alchemy magic depending on which chemicals are utilized, and the same applies in the Game Gear version, the only difference being that both diagrams are made up of 12 and 8 units respectively. Also, the latter version contains keys needed to proceed through later areas, whether in plain sight or dropped from slain rivals. Take note, no matter which chemical combo you experiment with, it's down the goddamn drain with them, in which case, I'd make every effort to reacquire those same flasks, or better yet, find more of the same type! Also, before I go any further, take note of the differentiating alchemy incantation shown here. And especially in the Game Gear version, aside from the four swords you're able to switch between. Even with all these innovative gimmicks and experiments, nothing, absolutely nothing will prepare you for what could possibly be yet another one of the most brutally difficult games ever conceived in existence. I shit you not, it makes even Comic Zone, Shadow of the Beast, Gunstar Heroes, Dynamite Heady, the original Mega Man, as well as Mega Man in base, Mega Man X3, and every Contra and Castlevania game combined seem like spring picnics by comparison, and will all but tempt you to dip your controller in molten steel for minutes on end like at the end of Terminator 2! Hence the focus of our next thesis, of course. The most common gripes, amongst many, concerning this underrated yet soul-crushing and problematic title aren't so much with the controls, which for the record, are on the convoluted and stagnant side, barring its obvious manageability. Honestly, the flip jumping corresponding aerial slash I can get to work at any given time, no harm, no foul. Aside from Shikan's lethargic, habitudinous pacing, it's more or less the tendency to avoid every peril, hazard, and liability that awaits you at every corner, notwithstanding how great your chances are at welcoming your own demise. And as if even that couldn't get any more nerve-wracking, determining which additional weapons are feasible for not only accessing new pathways, but dealing more damage to a specific terrestrial master, while avoiding every counter offense they provide, could be a catastrophically perpetual ordeal in and of itself, likewise with the klutzy out-of-place hit detection during certain confrontations with the aforementioned masters. Do I even need to establish that these factors are also where the next upcoming subject comes into play? Taking into consideration the earlier recounted decomposed the turkey talking control schematics and pretenseless, albeit baffling gameplay framework, both going hand in hand with each other? Concerning Shikan the Forever Man's challenge, just like with Ghosts and Goblins and Ghouls and Ghosts, consider this our keyword for this title, and especially its Game Gear counterpart, and most importantly, expect God knows how much of these, regardless of how far you fully intend to get at any cost. Even so much as attempting to bum-rush through this chaotic nightmare of a game is ill-fucking advised, cause it'll result in unexpected, infinite deaths due to ending up in any hazardous pit or bottomless chasm, let alone sudden overexposures to any offense whatsoever, hence the six skull bar on the top right corner of the screen in the Genesis version, each denoting two hits, or the single skull in the Game Gear version which dramatically sinks every time you get hit. Each and every domain, in both the terrestrial and elemental planes alike, contains everything that'll ensure your crusade goes to total piss-all, in tandem with all the creatures that roam throughout, some of which are total pussies, while there are others that'll make you their crack whore in record time. For instance, bats, cloaked figures, phoenixes and demons in the fire dimension, spiders, tentacled hives, and gas clouds in the earth dimension, winged demons, scorpion and demon warriors in the air dimension, and of course, dragonflies, reptiles, and assorted aquatic life in the water dimension. Same stick with their supreme reigning king and queen fucktard leaders. And in a game such as this, top notch reflexes, observation, perseverance, and ingenuity are your side by side BFFs on which to rely every step of the way, in tandem with the differentiating weapons and alchemy based magical wizardry, about which I can't stress enough in prompting everyone to refer back. Must I mention yet again that there's a time limit in each terrain you tread through, hence the hourglass, which for the record can be reset with your alchemy magic as I also established not too long ago? And don't expect any checkpoints either, except after you've cleared each corresponding phase of your current domain, let alone any save or password features, the latter two of which aren't available here by the way. Speaking of which, in the true fashion of the earlier sighted Ghosts and Goblins, upon clearing and dominating all 8 areas, or 6 in the Game Gear version, in addition to annihilating all the supernatural evildoers, be prepared for the ultimate troll fest in history! Remember that later interval I discussed a while ago? If you're playing on either normal or hard, another chance meeting between the Forever Man and Death himself ensues in which the latter promised him his valued gift of eternal life. But as it turns out, his task wasn't fully completed, seriously? Even so, following the closing credits in both versions, you've got another confrontation ahead of yourself, depending on which version you're playing. In the Genesis version, there's a huge behemoth like contraption that Shikan faces, with the Game Gear version featuring a futuristic inner sanctum through which he must tread while keeping its patrolling creatures at bay in order to reach its reigning evil robot master. Take note, you're only stuck with one chance in both versions. Survive the respective terrors, and these are the points in which you'll receive your true outcome. Fuck it all up, however, and it's all the way back to the beginning with your sorry ass. Talk about a fierce straight blast to the jaw! Anyways, beyond just these two very finales, kindly refer back to my previous batch of statements.
As much as I detest whipping up needless understatement after needless understatement, the graphics here are a mixed bag. Not that they suck ass in the least. Granted, its Game Gear counterparts downgraded in IOTA or two, but both are equally unique in my book, incorporating a gothic brooding essence throughout both the central warping hub and their corresponding terrestrial and elemental plane domains alike, in concurrence with the natural Earth-like settings supplied within them. Shakan by himself has got something of a unique, if awkward, flair to both his cutscene and in-game likenesses, animation-wise in the latter case, as do the multitude of demonic mutant adversaries he goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with, small and big alike. Though the appearances of the more aggressive boss leave god knows how much, if maybe a bit, to be desired, except maybe Elkenrod, Parasitus, the Synod riding Dragonfly clan leader, and of course the Tundra Beast. The special effects aren't too goddamn shabby either, most notably the light spheres that pop out whenever all enemies are exterminated, nor those previously recounted domains background-wise, complete with the latter's rather macabre and labyrinthine structures, providing an immense depth of exploration unlike any other. I'm looking at you once again, Metroid. All these and more are definitely faithful to its source material, namely the Krauss comics, thanks to the deft art direction of Steven Mira Ross. I mean, honestly, must they go any god fucking damn farther? Music and sound-wise, orchestrated with bravado and adequate relish by Mark Steven Miller and Jason Scheer, care of the short-lived New Romantic Productions, also of Tasmanians has an escape from Mars, Kate Chameleon, and Era of the Little Mermaid fame amongst many. The mishmashy soundtrack also boasts the same creepy, macabre, and ethereal theme as the visuals, while some tunes, if most of them, may turn out to be extremely ear-grating after quite some time, and that's understandable, I suppose. In hindsight, they're fucking phenomenal, headbang-worthy, and far from subdued. I really wish I could say the same about those who are in the Game Gear version, which, for the record, are almost virtually the same tunes rescored. I mean, lazy much Sega in extended play? And of course, their respective various health sound effects, but they're all the more reason to look the other way. Not so much the enemy deaths, or Shikan's damage groans, and his trademark death howl, which, yet again, you'll hear more often than one might expect, also heard in the Sega logo, in the Genesis version's case. And yes, there's even one in the Game Gear version. I know, talk about a recipe for earache, right? Anyways, if I had to pick my top 8, these would be as follows. The silent intro anthem, the central warp hub, the hourglass, aka the boss's intro speech from Shikan, the dragon Viking's theme for terrestrial air domain 1, the spider queen's theme for terrestrial earth domain 1, the mantis's theme for terrestrial water domain 1, the cyanide rider's theme for elemental air domain 2, and finally the tundra beats theme for elemental water domain 2, with an honorable mention aimed towards the credits theme, also reused in the Game Gear version as its own title and intro theme. Replayability-wise, considering that it's not for everyone, like with Super Godzilla and especially Super Metroid, and more for diehard comic fans, looking at you DC and Marvel communities, and challenge-hungry individuals alike, yours truly included, due to everything I've thrown out there thus far, running the game in from multiple pathways, and the groundbreaking areas of weapons and alchemy magic, to the alternating myriad of approaches in terms of exploring each varying terrain, and engaging in the most intense confrontations, it's no secret that you'll desire nothing more than to become adept in unlocking the darkest, deepest mysteries of Shikan the Forever Man. In short, why would any living soul on this godforsaken plane of existence see any reason to turn this sophisticated yet hair-pulling hidden gem down? Henceforth, what's my final verdict, one might ask? Notwithstanding all the gripes I've also discussed, it's more than a cinch to realize why this game and its handheld counterpart have become polarized for more than two decades, and by that I mean it's been shunned by even the most curious gamers and long since forgotten, while at the same time gaining a rather modest and religious cult following. On a scale of 1 to 10, here's how I rate the both of them. Either way, even if you've never read the Krauss comics, and if you're looking for variety in your title choices, something to what your gothic, occult appetite, or better yet, an extreme ultimate challenge unlike anything the free world could possibly unravel, ever, look no further than Shikan the Forever Man, and be sure to read and or scope out more of Robert A. Krauss's work, hence the link that you're about to see in the credits. Until then, happy Halloween, belated or otherwise, and autumn, if the latter. This is the Hardcore Retro God, eerily signing off.